नमस्ते लुइस नमस्ते वेलकम वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन सो नाइस टू मीट यू यू अगेन आई एम सो प्लीज टू सी अगेन सो लुइस व्हाट इज योर अर्लीएस्ट मेमोरी ऑफ नॉन वायलेंस और द कॉल एज अ कांसेप्ट और एज एन एक्सपीरियंस यस आई 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 हैव इट वेरी क्लियरली आई मीन I keep a diary, and a few months ago I was recording that my earliest memory of nonviolence comes from November the twentieth, nineteen ninety-eight. I was I went to the Dan Carlton Hotel in Medellin to the top floor, and it was Doctor Glenn D. Page, who had been a volunteer in the Korean War, and became a pacifist. A pacifist. and he was asking the question it is possible a killing free world a killing free society a non killing society mm-hmm. and he said he explained the definition of that and then he asked if we thought it was possible and in medellin colombia that he knew it was the capital murder city in the world we have more killing more homicide than any other city in the world per capita 70% of the people told it was possible only 30% uh, say no it's not possible when we when he asked why do you think it's possible or not out of the 70% who said it was possible i was the only one and out of the 30% it was not possible that like seven people went there and then he came up with the uh, the idea that a, 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 a killing free world is totally possible he explained why and he talked about the power of nonviolence that is my first memory How did you come to meet him? I come to to meet him because I like I love history and I was t- talking to anybody who will listen about from 91 92 on that the next century was going to be totally different because every century has a legacy mm-hmm. and I was telling them the legacy of the 20th century is the scientific development he went from unbelievable i mean remember that in in 1903 the right brothers flew for the first time so and but also the legacy of the 20th century is that the first, for the first time in history humans developed the ability to destroy all kinds of life on earth and atomic war this kind of crazy things so i thought the 21st century is going to be taking us to the basics not to the outside world but the inside world and to make peace inner peace so the the paradigm is, is not going to be success but happiness and happiness is an spiritual concept and it has to be with your inner peace and peace among the human beings so we i was talking to anybody and one friend told two other people who were university professors they were trying to organize a a, a business to to i mean for profit organization to try to go to to teach what the mainstream system is not teaching mm-hmm. they teach how to build bridges how to manage compa- but not about those things and they invited me and we created global learn and it was through global learn that we organized global learn okay and we organized the first national uh, encounter or event for uh, uh, education secretaries the state or municipal level and in that meeting we got glendy page to come ah to speak about non violence exactly because he was the director of the center for non violence in honolulu hawaii Yes. He then changed it to Center for Law and Killing, but by right. then it was Center for Law and Nonviolence. So that is why my first approach to nonviolence was then. Then, yeah, your childhood. You, you were just mentioning that you were born in 1954. So in a sense, you, both your childhood and your early adult years were lived entirely during the Civil War, which afflicted yeah. Colombia. Yeah, Did, I. I, I Yes, I Did tell you. Did that violence I, affect your perspective on life? Uh, not really, because I was a child growing up in a first of all, which is crazy. I I I, I grew up in a family with a lot of love. My father, 
It is difficult to believe in God. Never raise his voice to my mother. Never, even it crossed my mind that he could hit her. And domestic violence is a terrible epidemic in Colombia. So I, I grew up in like a different world. I would work four walks to, to my school, no problem. I felt safe. I do remember my uncles and aunties talking about the call, the violence, but the violence was something that was happening not in mainstream, in, in big cities. So it was not, it was like a, something else. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the actual tension, I, in my opinion, began in 1972, when a former military that was a, had been a dictator, mm -hmm. in my opinion, he was very close to, want, to win the elections as a president. And we all know what happened. At the end, he didn't win. Some people say that they pay him money for that or something. And that was the beginning of the guerrillas because the AIM, M19 movement, that was the beginning of the guerrillas. And they inspired the FARC to become a stronger guerrilla because they, they were not that yeah. so much organized. So that, that is when violence really began in this country. But you were living in Medellin even at the time when Pablo Escobar controlled yes. oh, so much oh, of life. Oh, in that, that was. Area. Uh, and I was, was living in. Yes. The drug, and drug I was so afraid violence. because there would be bombs exploding all over the place. I mean, I saw many times people killed on the streets. I, I, I saw people being killed, but I saw bodies in the mornings several times. And Pablo Escobar was totally crazy. I mean, he was an evil, but a crazy man. I don't know what, how much fault, how much is his fault, but it's crazy. So I went to live in Buga, Valle. I went to live in another city. I got, I, I, I got offered a, a job, some manager for a, an important company. And I decided I wanted to go because I wanted to leave Medellin because of the risk of any of my kids being, you know, blown up in any moment. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, then how did meeting Glenn Page change your life? Because I know that after that, you went on to do uh, totally, training to totally, be a nonviolence yeah. trainer. Totally. When I listen to Glenn, it's like uh, those moments in, in life when you said, this is it. So my friends really were much more interested in money. I was interested in meaning. So I took time for my job and I was with him all the time. And he told me, if you are so interested, why don't, why don't you go to the second international conference on nonviolence that we are going to hold in Atlanta, Georgia next April, April 6 to 10, 1999. And I had the luck that a very close cousin was living there. So I knew for me it was going to be cheap. And I knew the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Social Change, Change was in Atlanta. So I wanted to go. And when I went to that conference, that was it. I mean, I said, this is my life from now on. I mean, I was, I was like, I had been allowing the opportunity to be in heaven for a few minutes, just like that. I mean, this is unbelievable. And I decided, so I talked to the people who were in charge. I asked them for a meeting and they told me we are so busy now. Uh, I said, we have a lecture now from eight to 10 and then I, 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 I can't wait after 10. You know, we have a meeting because you have to discover what's going on for tomorrow. I, I will wait until that meeting at 11 30 p.m. on April the 8th. They met with me, they were exhausted and I was too. But right there, they decided they were going to come to me. I invited them to come to Medellin to be the, to hold the international conference, the next one here. And right there, we decided they would be September 10, 29. And they came and I was able to get everything they needed to come. And that was the beginning. And we agreed to go to a training. And so that's it. And then you had maybe the first time ever a, such a position existed, uh, that is to be the non-violence assistant to a regional... Advisor, advisor, right? the real world is advisor. advisor. Okay, non-violence... Yeah. Non-violence advisor, sorry, yeah. Non advisor advisor. Uh, to <laughs> a regional governor 
in Colombia. Yeah, exactly. So you to the state story. governor. But it's important because Antioquia is the largest, richest, and most powerful state in Colombia by far. So he is the he was the governor of the most important state, and I was a non-violent advisor to the governor. The problem is that I had already been trained. When Dr. Lafayette came here, I organized with my friends, and they meet. I, I had them, we had them to meet everybody with simultaneous translation. We began the training. So Dr. Dr. Page suggested to the mayor of Medellin and the most important city, I mean, the 10 more important people in Medellin that they should go to the two-day workshop so they can decide by themselves. So right there, they decided that the next week and the hotel that is very close to the Medellin airport, they would have the two-day call for the first time. And it was like the 29 more important people in Medellin plus me. I was there because I was organizing. And we went to the workshop. From there, they were so moved they choose me to select 120 leaders from all across the, 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 the board. I mean, young people, people that were members of gangs. I mean, people from the private sector, nuns, uh, teachers, university professors, so, and two, 120. So I selected those 120. We went to three, 40 people workshops, today workshops. And then we went to four weeks, not uh, consecutive weeks, but four full weeks being taught how to teach the, to, the today call. So when we graduated in November uh, 2000, then the next year, I was trying to contact the mayor of Medellin because the former mayor had been involved in the training. He went to the today workshop and I couldn't, and then, my friend from Global Learn talked to Gaviria, Guillermo Gaviria, and he was looking for somebody who would assist him in the philosophy of, 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 of Gandhi. And he told me that I had been trained and I, I went to work for him. That's it. So exactly? I worked for seven years. Yeah, but what was your job description? What were you expected <laughs> to do? I was expected to advise him in, in anything related to nonviolence because he totally changed his life. I mean, I invited him to the, to the next company in Kingston, Rhode Island in July. I met him, he was impressed. He, I invited him to the conference, the fourth international company in Kingston. He attended with his wife and hence he had asked his cabinet, the whole cabinet to go to the, to the workshop. And then he wanted me to be to his side because from that moment on, he never talked about anything related to his government without talking about non-violence. Because non-violence, as Dr. King just today, is a, for a transformational force at big scale. Big scale transformational force. And he needed, he knew we needed that in, in Antioquia. So my my job was being by him all the time but then after the, the Rhode Island conference he asked for Medellin to be the, the 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 city to hold the next international conference so the fifth international conference of non-violence was uh, held in Medellin April 23 to 26 2003 the Sunday before the the, the, the conference Guillermo Gaviria was kidnapped he couldn't attend, and then he was killed over, uh, almost 13 years, 13 months later. But he left behind a diary, which yes. has been published yes. uh, uh, as with the title of the diary of a kidnapped governor. Yes. Yeah. What does that tell us? Because here was a man who was committed to nonviolence. He held a yes. position of power, and he was kidnapped and held captive by people who believed in the power of the gun. How did he respond to that? How did he struggle with that? I mean, this is unbelievable. First of all, he was so convinced about non-violence that he left a letter to the people of Antioquia that in his diary. And he said, if I am kidnapped, I asked Eugenio Prieto to, to finish my term. 
And if I am killed, I ask my brother and Eva to continue with this legacy. I mean, he was, he knew he could be killed. And he, then he, in the, it's also in the diary, he sent a letter to his father when he was in captivity, explaining why he took that big chance. But he never complained. If you read his diary, he never complains about that. He says, I am more convinced than ever about the power of nonviolence. And, and, and when he was killed, I was really devastated. I mean, it was, I cried, I, I, I think I have never cried before. I mean, I was devastated, but his legacy is still alive. Don't you, I don't know if you know that there is this peace agreement in Colombia and we went to the town of Caicedo like a, a month ago with the park leaders who are now members of the Congress because they wanted to complete the march, they had a stop. And they want to ask for forgiveness to the people of Kaiser. Are you still it's, there? It's good. <laughs> I am, it's, it's so moving. Uh, is Guillermo's wife still alive? Is she? Did yes, she, she's alive. She, she's alive she, and she will be, she doesn't speak English, but she will be willing to talk through me because I could, could be translated because she has done that many times. Even for the, for the script. So she is the, also committed to nonviolence. She is also committed to nonviolence. And the irony, if I, if I remember correctly, is that Guillermo was not killed by his kidnappers. He was killed in a scuffle when the yes, army, when, yes. when the police were trying to rescue him. Am I correct? He, no, he was he was killed by his kidnappers. By his he kidnappers. Was. He's not, yeah, they, they, they all say, say that in Kaiseo. People have doubt what he was. What happened is this. May, many people criticize very strongly to President Uribe. I think President Uribe is a great man. And he was acting on it. The Constitution of Colombia that the president swears to follow says that the state has to be controlled all the area of Colombia. And there was this area and this, he knew, people knew the place in which they were kidnapped, retained, they were staying. They were moving, but they were staying in a certain area. And he had to take the decision between, should I try to rescue them or should I, allow the FARC to do whatever they want. So it's a very, he loved Guillermo, but he especially loved Gilberto Echeverri, Gil, Guillermo's peace advisor. And, and, and he has been a, a, a dear friend, of, a, a, a former minister and governor of Antioquia, as Uribe was. And at the end, the military convinced Uribe that the right moment to attack was May the 5th, 2003, because as far as they knew, El Paisa wasn't there with them. El Paisa and the leader. So they knew that the, the, those kids would not be able to kill those people they have been living for alone. Like they have, Guillermo and Gilberto were, have been teaching them English and math and things. So, but the government didn't know, the military didn't know that El Paisa had returned one week before. It's in the diary. Guillermo says, the Paisa is not here, the commander is not here, but one week, the commander arrived today. It was exactly by the day, one week before the attack. So President Uribe was convinced that they were able to rescue him, that it was a total disaster. They, they made a lot of noise. They put the military half an hour away. So the guerrilla had the opportunity to, to kill everybody. And you know what? There are three survivors. Of the, of, the, of the 11, uh, 10 were killed and the rest survived. The, the, he said, kill all of them. First, he said, go to the thing because we are living. So they were not, they knew the others were far away, the military. And when they were packing, they killed them. Because they killed them now, probably they have time to run or something. They were not expecting to, they killed them and they left. And then a few more survivors cry, say, please help me. And he sent somebody, go, get, go back and kill all of them. Be sure that they are there. And the three survived 
is out of luck. One was taking a bath and nobody remembered him. So he was, they are frozen, not even moving, thinking he was going to move, they would kill him, but they, nobody thought about him. The other was shot at many times and he was in shock, he thought he was dead. No, not one single bullet. He, he hide be behind a kind of bed and they two people with guns were shooting many, many, and he, psychological, he thought he was dead and nothing happened to him. And the other was behind under Gilberto. And when they, and he was full of blood in his head because a bullet had put a little bit. So the, the gorilla that came back to be sure that you were well dead, shoot at his leg. But he was in shock. He, he said, this is more death than the others. And he was alive. There is a, a, a TV program. He was interviewed of you a weeks ago, Tom. Okay. Oh, this loss, this tragedy of uh, Guillermo's death, it didn't shake your faith in nonviolence. Why? Not at all. I, I mean, because nonviolence in is, is in the same direction as evolution. Evolution is a force that is taking us up. It's from the one single cell to human beings, and it's still going. And it's, evolution is about raising up the level of conscience. And nonviolence is in the same direction. I mean, it's just a matter of time. I always say, Dr. King says, said, we have to learn to live together as brothers and sisters. And sisters, or we will perish together as fools. So far, the evidence is like telling us that we are going to perish together as fools. But I think the power of love will say the last word. And if we are going to survive, through, it's going to be to no violence, brotherhood, and maternal thinking. We need women in charge because women have been able to do it. We need the love, understanding, and creative value of women that have children. And they know, even if they don't have children, they are the ones that give life. And they know that there is no one single reason that justifies killing one single human being. Yeah. So. Yeah. You also live in the city, Medellin, that has perhaps the only victim museum in Colombia, yes. am I right? Yes. yes. And, 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 and if I remember correctly, the, at the entrance of the museum is a statue of Mahatma Gandhi. Yes, that was given to Medellin by the government of India. Right, right. So can you say a little bit about this museum? In what ways does it try to commemorate uh, the victims of the, this the, long the, civil the, war? The is, I'll tell you, but from the very beginning, I'll tell you this. The museum and the people that have directed the museum have been very criticized because they have tried to downplay the victims of the FARC and to try to blame all the guilt in the state. So it's like the FARC were just a, a few good guys that were fighting a, a just sword or something like that. So they have been very criticized for that. And there are, in fact, after the peace agreement, there was created a, that gave a special jurisdiction. So took the, 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 the FARC situation not to be judged by the Colombian law, but by the special judges that were chosen by the FARC. It's kind of crazy. And they were given places in the Congress and they were, I mean, they were given total impunity. So this is a big political discussion about that. But the museum, it has the worth of telling us what happened. The kind of hatred and terrible things people from Colombia were doing to other Colombians. It's like going uh, to, to, to the concentration camps in Germany today to see what human beings can do when they are blind and crazy. And, and, and despite that discussion and despite you see that if you go with open mind and you know the Colombian company, you will see that they are trying to 
downplay the, 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 for the FARC's responsibility, but it is important that people may know that humans many times are not guided by reasons, by just mm. by yeah. primal emotions. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it is, it is a, a, I think in many ways, a global phenomenon that many yes. people make a distinction between uh, what they consider justified violence of the people they agree with and the unjustified violence of the people they disagree with. Yes. Uh, so I, I, I sense from what you're saying that that was a very big factor in the Colombian conflict. Now, over the years, there were many attempts to make peace. Why yes. did this? Why did it finally happen? How and why did the peace agreement finally happen? Because I know that there was a lot of anxiety about. Yes, uh, but you listen, know, a, a peace agreement. Pre Pre yeah. President Uribe has signed a peace agreement with the paramilitary. They gave up the weapons. In, in in when they were very strong, they gave up weapons and they went to pay eight years in jail. And they, they didn't comply, and most of them were sent to the United States, extradited. And when President Uribe goes that agreement, many people criticize, and I agree then, I like him, but I agree that eight years was very little for those kind of crimes. But then President Santos, who was elected because he promised he was going to continue Uribe's policies, and he didn't, which According to the Colombian law, it's not possible because you have to present a program and you are elected over that program. So you cannot change it, but he did. And then he did sign this peace agreement with the, with the, with the FARC in which they were not uh, one single day to, to jail and they were given places in the Congress. And he said, this is, it, there are video records of he saying that is not going to happen, but it did happen. That is why the, the country is so polarized. And he said, he was criticized and he was so sure he was going to win. And he said, we are going to have a, 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 an election, a vote, a plebiscite is called. We are going to decide yes or not. And it was going to be October the 2nd, 1916. Exactly one week before the election took place, he invited President Obama, the King of Spain, or the President and the Prime Ministers of most important countries to the signing of the agreement before people were going to vote. And you know what happened? People vote no. And he didn't comply with that and they continue. And so, and, and to win the election, the second term, his, the, 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 the ads in the television were, if you vote no, it's because you are a warrior and you want war and you want peace, you don't want peace. And you have to, if you want peace, you have to vote yes even though they lost. So it, it, the, 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 the consequences for that kind of polarization are so terrible that I don't know how much is going to, how many years we are going to take to be able to overcome. So that is why I'm so convinced. I was invited to, to Caicedo to be with the FARC and I went and I accepted to have a, a, a view program by the Truth Commission that have been very criticized Many people say that the only name of truth is offensive to people because they are again in the same kind of uh, attitude, trying to justify the FARC and try to blame the guilt on the government. Very openly, it's, it's sad that it's very openly. So this country, I don't know where is it. And in fact, I am so happy that you called me because I was like looking for a sign that I'm not crazy. And then you come up in this moment. And it's like a sign from God telling me, don't, don't fail now, keep faith and move forward. And really I was, because I have been thinking about this a lot. And, uh, and but you know, we have many more problems than that. The, the, the death by war never have been close to 15% at most. They never reached 15%. They were close to 15%. The other 85%, 15% of the kids. Uh -huh. Sorry, what, the, what never reached 15%? 15% of the homicides, the people have been killed uh -huh. because of the war. 
Uh, the, uh. Other, the other 85% is what they call everyday violence. Oh. And half of it is domestic violence. Yes. So domestic violence produces three times the killings that the world. And domestic violence is mostly on women and children. Yeah. In Colombia, every day, more than one woman is killed by her partner. The one is supposed to love her. And I say that we, the, the only possibility we have is that we have to take non-violence seriously. And the only way to take it seriously, you have to take to make the teaching of non-violence mandatory at every single level of the educational system. Yeah. And that is my struggle now. And is that some of the work that you were doing when uh, back in 2014, yeah. when I visited, you were working for the city of Yes, uh, so yes. Can you uh, we describe have been working. What? Exactly. When Colombia, when Yolanda Guillermo Uruguay was senator, she got that law. And that law was going to be approved. It needed only one more session of the Congress. You need four sessions. The, the, the final one is just to prove it because Every discussion has been held. And you know what? It didn't pass because it was election time and the Congress never had enough quorum to vote. I mean, it's nuts. I mean, it's crazy. So that law was, wasn't approved. When I was working as a an advisor for the city of Medellin, I was working for the Secretary of Community Participation and I was going to the neighborhoods and teaching nonviolence and, and showing people the, the importance of solving conflicts without killing each other. So that was my job. Uh, right now, it's almost the same. I think we, we are, I am with a group of friends trying to reach the Colombian government to say that if you want to do something, we have to put non-violence in the mainstream of the educational system. It has to be mandatory. People have to learn to, to, to know what is going on about domestic violence, about this, the figures, poverty. You know what is the, probably the poorest individual single indicator of the problem in Colombia? Is uh, pregnancy of girls 18 years old under, what do you call it? youth, juvenile pregnancy, from even from 11. 12 to 16, 17. And you know what? According to the figures of the National Institute of Family Wellbeing, the official institution, in the last five years, more than 52% of the kids that were born were not wanted, were unwanted babies. More than 52, more than half. And about 30% of those were born out of girls under 16. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. To what extent is poverty a factor in this situation? Is it that there are broken families and poverty? I know yeah. are one factor, but I remember that you had taken me to see a program called the Good Start Program. Yes. Which, if I remember correctly, is based on the premise uh, that we now know from scientific research uh, that if a child, if an infant is even left unattended uh, when it yes. cries out, uh, that <laughs> ne neglect in infancy and early childhood uh, has a deep impact and such children are much more likely to become violent adults. Am I correct? Of course, of course. You're right. Uh, so can you just briefly describe what the Good Start program was trying to do to change this? Good Start is a program that is meant to provide all needs for boys zero to five years old. Only boys? No, excuse me, children. Mm -hmm. Children, of course, no, no. Children from zero to five years old. Having, if the mothers have to work, they have substitute mothers, women that are really care of kids, provide health, and give them all the medical and, uh, attention and the nutrition they need. It's a very important program, and it's common in many countries. But 
I don't know if I told you about uh, James Prescott. James Prescott is a PhD an American researcher that he studied 50 years. Chimpanzees, chimpanzees, you know, because they are the, uh, as far as, as um, the closest to us, genetically speaking. Bonobos, because mm -hmm. they, were, they are the, the most Pacific uh, beings they know, and human beings. And after 50 years of research, and he has a powerful videos on that, he demonstrated what happened when you have love and, and, and you are touched. And he developed the 10 principles of the uh, relationship, mother, child, that are the basis for, the, for peace in the world and, the, and understanding in the world. I have them, I can send them to you. They were written in English. I translated them to, into Spanish. And I said that those should be included in the Mainanian development goals. We have to do that. We cannot continue having kids that are unwanted and are going to be abused because, I mean, I, I always tell people when I, I was invited by the Colombian government to give 20 workshops, two-day workshops to the victims of the, of the conflict. And they are, are as divided as the country. They were victims by the FARC or victims by the paramilitary, like they are enemies, it's crazy. So Yolanda was the director of the National Institute for Victims. And she hired me to do that. And when I listen to the pain and the lies of those people, I just came to the conclusion, I am the person I am just because I was lucky. If I have been the son of a single mother or father who abused me since I was three, I probably will be a guerrilla of member and killing people. I mean, it's just out of luck. And that is very shocking, very shocking. So taking care of kids and the basic needs is the way. Gandhi said, there, there is no place to, wish, to, to ways to peace. Peace is the way, <laughs> something like that. So we have to take care of children. We have to teach girls that they make pregnant before they are Adults, they have more times, more possibility of being poor. And if their mother was also single mother, they will be poor almost forever. We have to teach them there. We have to empower women. And, 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 and this is something that I, people forget when you are talking about peace in most countries. And I think this is not even something but math. We are two genders, men and women. 90.2% of people are men or women. Almost 1.5%, a little more, are what undecided. It's, it's a fact, biologi biological fact. So, but if we are women, men and women, if we are going to have peace, there has to be some kind of equilibrium between men and women. And even today, the difference in between being a man and a woman is astonishing. It's unbelievable, it's crazy. And we have to focus on that. Look at what's going on in Afghanistan. I mean, in many countries, you look at it. You are from India, isn't it? Yes. Look at the, at the gun rapes in India. I mean, in many countries, in the States, in the United States, the, the violence exerted to women by people from the military forces, usually, are more violent than others. So. We have to say we need night. We have to raise our kids in a different way, and we have to take care of girls, especially. And if you look, if you read uh, the book by uh, by Melinda Gates, the moment of lift, you have to read that book because she demonstrates that they came to the conclusion by experience uh, that you want to improve the world, you have to work in girls. Girls take care take care of their children or their sisters, their parents. They work for the family. Men are more selfish. Yeah. It's a fact. But, uh, you know, currently uh, a lot of people, uh, uh, some people in India 
are also realizing the importance of focusing on boys early in life yes in other words in in educating boys so that they break these patterns exactly you know what doctor when i talked to i talked to doctor james prescott i told him doctor prescott we have to put it in every educational system in in, in college he said, no it's too late we have to teach girls and boys since the very very moment they are taught about human reproduction we have to tell them how to take care of yeah. children yeah so this is unbelievable it is possible i think it's so possible the only thing we need is political will but sometimes it's like the world is going in the totally opposite direction when you see that donald trump was the president of the united states you have to think we are crazy i mean how come <laughs> so that's the problem uh, what are you engaged with these days yes. what is what are you working on i am i am first i have been uh, working with the secretary of community participation mm. uh, I, i i i will give in a workshop next wednesday mm -hmm. to young people that are leaders in the in their communities mm -hmm. Uh, the, the problem is that sometimes for political or economic reasons, mm -hmm. they are not very, uh, very, very often. I mean, the last time I did that, it was like a, six months ago, mm -hmm. but I continue doing that. Uh, I am now advising uh, a, a company Uh, in, 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 in issues of uh, human relations and organizational climate, organizational environment, uh, organizational uh, yeah, culture. Okay. And I keep studying and, and non-violence all the time. So in wrapping up, uh, what advice would you give to young people? Because I think across the world, there are many young people who want to work for non-violence. But yeah. sometimes I, I, they feel daunted because around them they see so much violence. So, what is your advice? How can they my, build strength? My advice is this: there is a, a book called The Soul Code. The it says uh, there is a book called The Soul Code, the code of the soul. He said, "I will tell them your most important job is to look for you what you what you have inside. You you have to become." that you were meant to become. Listen to your heart. Listen to your, what are you good for? And go for that. Don't try to do something because it's going to give you money. Try to be yourself. Second, you have to be able to, the, the spirituality is something that is available to everyone. It's the, it's the ability to create inner peace at any moment. Try to go, be as good at that as possible, and you will be in control of your life. And understand that violence is the neg is to the, the denial of, the denial of intelligence, because when you use violence, you are giving leaving out the capacity to think and to speak. That is what distinguishes human beings from animals. If you do that, you may have a kind of difficult life. You will have a happy life and you will grow happier and happier but you will see you, there is a match between what you are doing and you were meant to do. Thank you so much. You are welcome. It's an honor being here. <laughs>